By the end of this video, you should know everything you need to make your first custom Unity package. Not the basic .unity package file that you import into your project assets folder, though we will cover that just for a couple of minutes, but a real version custom package with dependency management that lives in your project's packages folder. Packaging can really help you with working towards modularization of your systems, which is a cornerstone of software engineering. Let's take our code from last week's video and create a package for it step by step. I want to quickly mention a new tool that's on the Unity Asset Store. Now this editor selection tool lets you highlight things as you mouse over and then will highlight in a different color when they're actually selected. It ignores objects that are painted on the terrain and the terrain itself. You can customize the tool from the top bar clicky. It ignores UI elements and canvases. Now the creators of this tool have given me a few licenses to hand out, but there's a limited number. So if you want, head over to the Asset Store and pick it up while it's still on sale. Link to that tool will be in the description. The first thing I want to do today is point out a setting that you might need to turn on in your project settings. If you navigate down to version control, you'll see it has a setting called mode. Here you can toggle the meta files to be visible or hidden. In newer versions of Unity, this should default to be visible. So of the two kinds of packages we're going to talk about today, we're going to start with the ones that will appear under the assets section of your project window. These are the kind of assets that you typically see as one file with an extension .unity package. You can create your own. This is also the format they come in from the asset store. Now these files are just a collection of assets. They don't have any version control, no dependency management. They're not really part of Unity's UPM system, which we're going to get to later. You can make your own Unity package easily by right clicking anything in your project and selecting export package. This will give you a little window where you get to select what's going into the package. If you keep include dependencies ticked, it's going to try to find all the direct and indirect dependencies of your package and include them. I'm going to untick that because I really just want to package up the improvement timers code. I'm going to exclude our example from last week because it's not necessary. Now if I click the export button it'll bring up a window to let me pick where I want to save this package. You can give it any kind of name that you want and then click save. All done. I've started an empty project here that we can test different things out with during this video. You can just right click in the project folder and choose to import your asset. I'll select the one we just exported here. We'll bring that in. It lets you verify which files you want to bring in. Click import. And that's really it. It might do a little compilation if there's some scripts in there, and then all of your files will show up under the assets section of your project window. So anytime you import one of these files with a .unity package extension, it's going to show up under the assets section of the project folder. And generally speaking, those kinds of things are mutable. You'll be able to read all of them, modify all of them as you see fit. I use this sometimes for convenience. If I pull in an asset pack that isn't in URP, I just convert it all and export it that way so I don't have to do it next time. But let's move on to what goes under the packages section of the project window. In the Unity documentation, this is called a custom package. There is some pretty good documentation about this on the website, but there's a lot of it. It can be overwhelming and I could understand why it would be off-putting too. So for the rest of the video, we're going to work on putting all the code we built in the last video into a custom package so that we can reuse it in future projects. You'll see just how easy it is. On the screen here, I've got the suggested package layout, and we're going to adhere to that for the most part. You can create your custom package anywhere you want. I'm going to do it right in this folder of files that we just imported, except I don't need any of these because we already have a repository. The only problem is our repository was not created in this kind of format that's suitable for custom packaging. So I'm going to wipe out all these files and then I'm going to jump into git bash so that we can connect to the existing remote repository. I don't have a local repository yet, so I'll do a git init. Then I'm going to connect this local repository to the remote that already exists and we'll do a git fetch. An easy way to get all the files from the remote right here onto the local is to do a git checkout dash b. Dash b is for a branch and should automatically check you out to the branch that you name. I'm already on master, that's fine. But I can also set the upstream branch, which is origin slash master. By doing this, I am now in sync with the remote. Our old repository was set up like a Unity project, so we have an assets folder here. Now, deep down inside of there, there's a scripts folder and our improved timers code. But what I want is for this custom package to have a folder here for runtime files. Let's make a new folder for that. So a typical custom package will have a runtime folder. It might have an editor folder if you have some editor scripts and some other folders for your tests and documentation and so on. Right now, I'm just going to grab all of the scripts that we wrote last week 
and I'm going to pull them up and put them into this runtime folder. So that was actually all of the code from last week's video. We've just moved it into the runtime folder. So we don't really need this assets folder anymore or anything that's under it. We'll get rid of that. This also is not a project anymore. This is just going to be a standalone package. So we can remove the git ignore file. Now we do need a few more files if we're going to abide by normal conventions. Let's jump back into the command line. Very quickly, I'm going to create some markdown files that are empty for license, change log, and most importantly, that we cannot have a package without is our manifest, and that's going to be called package.json. So if I do a clear here and just have a look at the status, you'll see, yeah, obviously, it looks like I've deleted a lot of things and there's some things that haven't been staged yet. So if I come down to the prompt again here and I just type git add period, that will add everything at this level and below in the folder structure. It's a little easier to see once everything's staged. There's only a few things that were actually deleted. Most things have actually been renamed to a new location in the runtime folder. But we're not quite there yet. There's a few more things we need to add and we can do that from Unity. I'm just going to jump into Unity, press Control R so I get a reload and let's see what's now in our improved timers folder. There we go. So we've got all of our scripts into the runtime folder and we've got a few empty text files that we're going to have to fill out and I still have the readme from the original repository. There is a small C sharp script change that I want to make so let's jump into the runtime folder. Last week I had set the player loop utils to be in its own namespace, but I think just for consistency, I'm going to have everything in my custom package share the same namespace. So this is a very easy change. I'm just going to replace it right here. And then I'm going to go over to the one place that it's actually referenced and remove that. Okay, so that was just a little bit of cleanup. And I think I'm going to do one more little bit of cleanup. And that is last week we created a countdown timer, but I've since added a frequency timer and a stopwatch timer. Let's just separate those into a folder. We'll call it timers. I'll just drag and drop them in there. One reason to be doing this kind of thing here in Unity and not from the command line is that custom packages need almost every file to have a meta file. And so as we're working with things, including the markdown files here, Unity will generate a meta file for each of them. In fact, the only files that don't need a meta file are ones that end with a tilde character. Those ones are ignored by Unity. Okay, next thing missing here is an assembly definition for the runtime folder and everything under it. Some people like to name their assembly definitions after the name they put in their package, which would be something like com.companyname.packageName. But I like to name mine after the namespace. It's just a convention. Let's take a quick look at some of the properties of this assembly definition. If I were to fill in the root namespace here, that's actually a convenience for your IDEs. They will help them to automatically fill in a namespace if you were to add more scripts to this. It makes it the default namespace for everything that falls under this assembly definition. Something I think that confuses beginners a lot is the auto reference checkbox. This ensures that any scripts or assemblies without their own ASM def files can automatically use the assembly without any special configuration. The override references checkbox lets you have strict control over which dependencies belong to this particular assembly definition. You can specify those in a list if you turn the checkbox on. So think of these two things as the first one is who can use this? And the override one is about this assembly definition depends on these other things. Since we're going to keep this simple, I'm just going to scroll down and click apply. At this point, it's probably a good idea to do a little sanity check. So why don't we just make a simple little example script. I'll come right up to the scripts folder in my project and just create a new mono behavior script. Then we can just open it up in Rider and we'll just write the shortest test possible to make sure that the namespace and the assembly definition are working correctly. So let's first of all include using improved timers. I'm going to hit Alt Shift F to auto format this document. Let's get a definition to a countdown timer. And I'm just going to set that up in the start method with a start time of, let's say, five seconds. Let's debug a message when it's done and start the timer. In update, we can output the progress. On destroy, we'll just dispose of the timer. That should be enough to test that our improved timers are working as expected. Back here in Unity, I'm just going to create an empty game object and add the example script to it. Then we can press play and we should see a whole lot of progress coming out in the log until it's finished five seconds later. Okay, sanity check complete. Everything's great. Timer counted all the way from five down to zero and just stopped at zero now. So everything is almost ready for our package, but we haven't done anything with those empty markdown files or our package manifest file. Let's start with the package.json manifest file. 
I'm going to paste in the one that comes in the Unity manual as an example, and we can just strip away all the useless stuff here. Let's start right at the top with the name. Now, the name is going to be like a reverse DNS style name. So we're going to put com.company name, which I'll put git amend in here. And then package name, we can just call this improve timers. Now, as I mentioned before, some people like to name their assembly definitions after this name too, but again, it's just a convention. Now, it used to be in Unity that you could specify your version as 0.0. some number, and that would make it a preview package, but you can't do that anymore. In fact, you can't specify it as experimental or preview at all. So let's just make it 1.0. For our display name, let's just make that improved timers. If we come down to Unity here, that means which version of Unity is the minimum we can use. And the field below that, Unity release, that's if it was a specific beta or alpha release you wanted to be targeting. We'll get rid of that. In addition, we don't have any public URLs for documentation, changelog, or licenses. Instead, we're including those files. You don't need to reference them directly. I'm going to cut out the second dependency, but just so we can see dependencies in action, I'm actually going to include Cinemachine here. So I'll put the latest Cinemachine as of this recording as a dependency of our package. I'll remove that later. Keywords, I'm not going to worry about that for... The author, this is optional too, but uh, for here, I guess I'll put in our YouTube channel as the URL and I'll just put my name in here. Don't worry about email. So this is fairly minimal, but you actually only need the top two lines. Everything else is optional. Let's move on to the next file, changelog. A changelog entry should have the version and the date, add a title, and then add some bullet points about what's being introduced in this new version. It's especially good to mention any bug fixes and any breaking changes. Move on to the license. There's all kinds of free licenses out there, and I'm just going to paste in the unlicense with one small amendment. And finally, we have a readme file. So this just needs your notes, maybe some example usage. And because we've brought it into the package the way we have, it now has a meta file associated with it too. So let's jump back into Git and make sure that we've added all these files because we're pretty much done. We can make a new commit here. I'll just make it a very simple message. Okay, that should check in all of our files. I'm just going to clear this and we'll do a git log just to make sure we only have the one new commit on top of our old one. There's nothing strange going on. That looks fine. Let's push this up to the master branch. And with that done, let's come over to a browser and just have a look here. I've refreshed the page, and so we can take a look at how all of our files look. Changelog, license, package. We'll come back and remove the dependency of Cinemachine in a little bit here after we experiment with it, just so everybody can see what it looks like. If we expand the runtime and the timers folder, of course, we can see all of our scripts as well as our assembly definition in there. The structure is the way we expect. All the files are there. You can check and make sure that everything has a meta file. Looks good. So if we come back to the main Git page, I can come up to the code button, click down and copy the Git URL here. Now I've created a totally empty project here called Empty Unity 6. And I use this project sometimes just for testing things like packages. So in the package manager, if I click the plus icon, I can choose to import from Git URL. And I'm just going to paste in the URL I copied from the GitHub page. Uh, this will start to Unity thinking a little bit as it installs the package. And it's not only installing the package, but it's also installing the dependency of Cinemachine in the background. So we're going to see that in just a second. I'm just going to use the magic of editing to speed that rate up, but it really only took about 30 seconds, maybe less. Okay, so if we look here in the package manager, yes, of course, now Cinemachine is installed and we can't remove it. And if you hover over it, check it out. You get a message that says you can't because another package depends on it. Which package is that? Well, it's the improved timers here. If we click on that, you can see that Cinemachine is being used by this package. You can see all the other metadata about this in the right hand panel in the inspector. So that's just a quick peek into how you would actually define a dependency in your package manifest. If we were actually using it as part of the timer system, you'd want to make sure that that was referenced in your assembly definition that needed it as well. But of course, your IDE is going to tell you all about that. Since we actually don't have any dependencies for this package, let's just remove it entirely. I'm going to put in a slightly better description here. So let's get this back into the repository as if Cinemachine never was a dependency in the first place. And to do that, we're going to rewrite history with a git amend. First, let's make sure we stage the manifest. Then we can do a git commit dash dash amend dash dash no edit. So that overrides the last commit. We can check our changes by typing out git log. And then if we're happy, we can do a force push onto master. If we jump back over to a browser quickly and refresh the page, we should be able to see those changes reflected in the package.json file. And sure enough, 
it, the dependency is gone. Now, there's just one more thing I want to talk about today, and that is local packages. Some of you might not want to put your packages on GitHub for public consumption. And I use one of these all the time, and that's for project setup. In the package manager, if you click the plus icon and come down to install package from disk, you can install a package the same way as you would from a Git URL. So here I've got a local package, but I don't have a readme or anything. This is just my private package. If I select the manifest and open, suddenly I have my custom editor tools being imported and I'll get a new menu up at the top as soon as it's done compiling. Now, what this is going to give me is just my setup tools that I like using when I first create a new project. So that's just like importing groups of assets that belong together, or just the group of assets that I like to bring into every single project. Now that evolves over time and that's why I don't version this package. That's why I don't put it anywhere public. It's just going to change as my preferences change as a developer. So let's do a quick recap. Packages in a nutshell, you need an assembly definition for your runtime scripts. You might need one for your editor scripts if you have one. You need them for your test scripts too if you have folders containing tests. You need the package.json file with at least those first two lines in it. And every file in here that doesn't end with a tilde needs a meta file. And if you can meet those criteria, you've made a package. So I guess my challenge to you is if you've never made a custom package before, why don't you make one today? Grab some code that you like using in every single project and put together a local package. Don't even worry about the GitHub part of it. Just get it into a folder and make sure that you can import it correctly. Once you've got it all working on the local, then worry about the GitHub part. And even then, you know, you can keep it private if you want. Only make it public if you really want to share it with a lot of people. And that's where we're going to wrap things up for today. I've got another interesting video planned for next week. If you don't want to miss that one, make sure you hit the bell. Hit the like button if you haven't. Drop a comment below if you have any questions. I'll either see you there or I'll catch you on Discord. Actually, I think I'll add one more pro tip just for anybody who watched all the way to the end of the video. I recently saw somebody asking a question about one of my videos on another Discord, not our Discord. The question was, why does git amend always add an empty delegate to his actions when he's programming? And the answer to that is that that is a pro tip that came from John Skeet, who is the author of C Sharp in Depth, which is probably the most detailed book about the inner workings of C Sharp that exists. And so my pro tip to you is not to answer that question. I can answer that in another video. My pro tip is that you should go to John Skeet's Stack Overflow page and have a look. Scroll down about halfway down the page, you're going to see a list of all the questions he's ever answered sorted by upvotes. Click through the answers link and you'll see all 35,000 plus answers he's ever provided. Just pick them from most popular and go down the list. I guarantee you will learn something new every single day.